Welcome to the Penguin Podcast. Just a friendly warning that there is occasional use of strong language. Hello and welcome to the Penguin Podcast, the place where leading authors reveal their creative process by choosing a handful of objects that have inspired them. I'm Katie Brand, and today I'm joined by the Vice Chairman of Ogilvy, the advertising and marketing agency. His TED Talks have over 6.5 million views, and he's become the champion of counterintuitive thinking. And happily, he's accepted our brief and brought along objects that have inspired his own writing, including a can of Red Bull and a roulette wheel. It's Rory Sutherland. Rory, welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be on. Thank you very much for coming along. So before we find out why you've chosen these particular objects, Rory, your latest book is called Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. Can you tell us briefly to those listeners who haven't yet uh, read it, just set out your stall a little bit. What's the kind of the, the basic premise and the through line of the book? It's simply the fact that a kind of very, very shallow rationalism has taken over the world of decision-making. Everything you do has to make sense in a very, very narrow kind of way. My argument is it's a completely fatuous, indeed doomed-to-fail enterprise to try and construct these kind of economic models of the world and to therefore construct entirely rational, sensible modes of encouraging people to change their behaviour. We've got to actually be comfortable with doing things which are counterintuitive, weird, non-linear. More or less the same thing can make you happy or make you angry, simply dependent on the style in which something is done. I'll give you a tiny example of this, just from my experience in the last week, funnily enough. If you turn up to pick up your dry cleaning, let's say, or you turn up at a cafe or a tea shop and you find it's closed... You're a bit pissed off, but you go away and you blame yourself. Twice in the last few weeks, I've had the experience where you turn up in a shop, you go through the door and you stand there and someone comes out and says, I'm sorry, we're closed. Materially, objectively, there's not much difference. You've arrived at a shop after it closes. The first one is an annoyance. The second is an insult. Mm. And what you'll find is in the second case, you'll possibly go away determined never to patronise that shop for the next 10 years. And is that because you feel that your emotional response is, well, you're here, you could be open, and somehow in front of my face you're telling me you won't yeah, serve me? We tend to take it personally, I right. think. I mean, anthropologists have known this for ages, that what something is economically, what something might be objectively, does not map very neatly onto a human emotional response and therefore does not map neatly onto a behaviour because what drives human behaviour is not what something is but what something means. And the meaning has all sorts of contextual dependencies. This is why I start the book by talking about Red Bull. And before we move on to oh. that, you've just done it perfectly. You've done your own segue because Red Bull, a can of Red Bull here, we've got here in the studio, is your first object. So there you are. You have intuited uh, my structure perfectly. So oh, explain <laughs> explain to us. I like to provide uh, my own segues. That's you know. good, yes. It's like a musician bringing exactly. their own instruments. So, yes. um, uh, no, so the... why have you brought a can of this funny tasting drink along? Let's say you'd sat down 15, 20 years ago before Red Bull, I think it then existed in Thailand in a very niche form. I think it was popular with late-night lorry drivers to keep them awake. Now, imagine you sat down and said, we want a drink to kind of challenge the hegemony of Coca-Cola. The first thing you would have said rationally is, you want a drink that costs less than Coke, tastes nicer than Coke, and comes in a really big can, so people get great value for money. Makes perfect sense. That would be nodded through your board of directors within seconds. You would immediately set out to research consumer taste, looking for things that met those criteria. If you went to potential consumers, no one would ever disagree with you that that's what they were looking for. Nicer tasting drink, lower price, bigger can. The problem arises when you look at what is the most successful attempt to compete with Coke in 50 years, which is Red Bull, and which, if you think about it, costs a fortune, comes in a tiny can, and tastes kind of horrible. Now, when I say it tastes horrible, this is complex. Um, they researched it with a company which specialises in only in testing carbonated drinks, and it got the worst reviews they'd ever seen. Uh, people were sort of saying... In a taste test. I wouldn't drink this piss if you paid me to, more mm -hmm. or less. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that, as I said, everything has an emotional response which is not only a product of what it is, but the context in which it's perceived. As a soft drink, if you took, say, Fanta as a comparison, OK, Red Bull's a terrible soft drink. 
as a drug and as a placebo drug, it's brilliant. Mm. And the point is that the qualities that make for a great soft drink are completely disparate to the qualities that make for a great placebo. You expect anything that has psychoactive powers to taste weird. And also there's a sort of overtone that it's somehow medicine. But exactly. This is actually medicinal. It gives you wings. Uh, the fact that it's in a small can says it's so potent we actually have to restrict the dose. Yeah. By the way, I mean, uh, nearly all drugs are more effective if you tell people they're expensive, particularly painkillers, particularly if the effect is psychoactive. The interesting point there is the same thing in a different context or with a different expectation can be either a disadvantage or a strength. And I suppose, coming from the advertising industry, we've known that for years, or rather we've, we've instinctively known it, we haven't codified it very well, that by telling little stories or by changing what you might call the lighting or the focus or the direction of attention, you can take a product and effectively turn a weakness into a strength. And so, as I said, you know, Red Bull as a soft drink is probably terrible. Red Bull, once you create the belief around it that it has psychoactive powers is brilliant. In fact, the last thing we want is delicious tasting drugs. Health food's got to taste a bit crap, otherwise we don't believe it. Diet Coke, by the way, if you've ever been puzzled by the Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Red Coke disparity, Diet Coke, to be a diet product, has to taste a little bit more bitter than regular Coke, because otherwise we won't believe it. So that's why, weirdly, you need the diet product, which is the one that has the little bit of palpable self-denial to it. It's slightly more lemony and slightly more acidic, less sweet, in other words. The Coke Zero is the no-sugar alternative that tastes as much as possible, pretty much identical to, the ordinary Coke product. And so there are lots and lots of cases where, strangely, you have to add a negative to something in order for that thing to make sense. As I said, health food, there's a limit. Probably if you're selling low-calorie ice cream, it's got to taste a tiny bit less luscious <laughs> than real ice cream, or else we don't trust it. And this, by the way, has important implications in um, uh, things like if you want to make products more environmentally friendly. Because one of the unfortunate effects is that if you put this product is kind to the environment on, say, a washing powder, consumer perception will be affected by that and will automatically assume it's doing less good a job at cleaning clothes. And then sometimes people react by overdosing. Sometimes people abandon the product. To be honest, a very large part of that is psychological. You talk about this phrase I think you've invented called psychological, not psychological, but psychological. Yeah, there's a kind of logic which is, I suppose, the product of evolutionary uh, forces, which means that the way we make decisions may seem illogical to an economist, but once you understand perhaps the ancestral context for those decisions. By the way, there is an enormous value to highly emotional behaviour in many cases. So someone who never loses their temper will essentially end up getting dicked around. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you know, there are cases where people actually lose their temper and fight back against impossible odds. And that may, taken in isolation, look like an insane thing to do. But if you aren't occasionally prepared to do that, then you'll end up at everybody else's mercy, mm. for example. So once you dig down a bit deeper and you look at the value of it over time, not in a one-off incident... Quite a lot of things suddenly make sense, which appear to be very silly. At the very simplest level, by the way, we can't be completely rational and consistent, as economists want us to be, simply because anybody who is completely consistent and logical would be very easy to hack. Mm. You know, In other words, you would know exactly how they would respond to any particular stimulus, and therefore leading those people into a trap would be disproportionately easy. And you make a very interesting point in the book about this notion that we all think that the conscious mind is the thing that's in charge, but you call it the press room, where really it's sort of laying a narrative on uh, over, over things that we are really responding to unconscious or subconscious uh, behaviours. It, it's largely, largely it's post-rationalising things. So it's worth asking the question, in fact, um, what's reason for? And this is something which does occasionally um, preoccupy evolutionary psychologists, anthropologists, and so forth. Because if you think about it, all other living animals survive without a sense of reason. You know, you don't get sort of dogs going around going, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> they function, survive, reproduce perfectly effectively on instinct alone. And the argument certainly of um, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber, who are two French anthropologists, is that reason is a very, very late evolutionary addition, 
it wasn't added to the brain really with the purpose of influencing our decision-making in and of itself, but rather it was a necessity as a social species to both argue your case towards others, to perhaps defend your behaviour, or to assess the arguments of others. Humans are attracted to a story. We, we somehow like humans are love to tell oh, a story. Fa- and, therefore... and there are particular types of story which seem to resonate, particularly if it adheres to one of these sort of narrative structures that humans seem to particularly love, you know, virtue rewarded, persistence rewarded, those kind of fairy tale like structures seems to be both more memorable and more emotionally affecting and also more shareable. I mean, I occasionally call stories the PDF files of the human mind. Mm. You know, in other words, they're a common format for information which seems to be both easily storable, easily retrievable, and easily shareable. Rather like if you want to share a document with a whole bunch of people not knowing what their particular computer's like, you produce it as a PDF file and you email it around. And stories seem to have something, you know, there's some sort of element of data compression to them somehow. And also it helps us create some sort of order about our fear of chaos, perhaps, that we can sort of lay a story or a narrative, even on our own chaotic behaviour. it's a categorisation mechanism because stories allow us to categorise certain things. Yes, and we can calm ourselves down. If we've just done something that we think might be a bit crazy... We go, ah, but it's a bit like that. Yes, and now the reason... And you start to sort of justify it in hindsight and create the narrative as to, to lead up to the point where you really had to do this thing or you really had to buy that handbag or you really had to have that extra bottle of champagne or whatever it is that you sort of know deep down probably you didn't really need to do, but you're going to tell yourself the story that you deserved it or you'd had a bad day. Wonderful book, Timothy Wilson, Strangers to Ourselves, for example, which more or less suggests that, in fact, our consciousness is mostly... I think the phrase of Jonathan Heights was, it thinks it's the Oval Office when in reality it's the press office. The other way you could put it is it's mostly post-rationalising. That what it does is we do something instinctively and what our conscious mind does is it constructs a plausible and consistent explanation for our actions as though that were the reason for the action in the first place. And that's that's where it's misleading. Now... A very useful uh, distinction here I always make is toothpaste, which if you asked anybody why they clean their teeth and why they use toothpaste, they would immediately go off in a dialogue about tooth decay, gum health, uh, preventing cavity, the removal of plaque, etc. If you look at when people most reliably clean their teeth, it would be first thing in the morning, before a date, before you go out for the evening. Okay. Now, what that suggests is that the deep down motivation is more about avoiding bad breath and looking good. It's more about vanity. Additional evidence for that is, A, I asked someone at Colgate and they said that was broadly true. Now, I think Colgate kind of know this stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you think about it, Colgate's phrase, the ring of confidence, was clever because it covered both those use cases. The rational one of, I can go to the dentist with my kid, feeling confident we won't need many fillings and I won't be socially shamed by the appalling state of my children's teeth, but also confidence, which is, I turn up at a party Um, without feeling massive social anxiety. If you think about it, 95% of the toothpaste in the world seems to be flavoured with mint. Now, mint patently isn't about dental health. It's about freshness of breath. There's a J.P. Morgan quote, which is, every man has two reasons for doing something, a good reason and the real reason. (laughs) I'm not quite as negative as that, but I think in many cases there's the official rational reason why we do something, and then there's the deep-down reason. If you start talking to people about dishwashers, they'll immediately start talking about, well, of course, the purpose of a dishwasher is to clean my plates and knives and crockery and so forth. Probably the main value of a dishwasher is it gives you a place to put dirty plates out of sight. (laughs) Okay, I always joke that the, the, the value of a swimming pool is, yeah, it's officially it's that you swim in it, okay, and you get exercise or that you enjoy swimming. A very large part of the value of a swimming pool is that you can wander around your garden in the summer in a bathing costume without feeling like an idiot. (laughs) The possibility of a swim is stronger than the swim itself. No, exactly. And (laughs) and also the licence that it gives you to dress outdoors in a way that makes you feel ridiculous in any other back garden. There's a kind of uh, framing value to a lot of products, which is it's not really what they're actually for in themselves. It's also what they allow you to do. 
An example of that is you know, when you're at a party, you don't want to talk to people all the damn time. You know, if you're mildly introverted, you might want to spend 20% of the time just on your own and 15% of the time looking out of the window. And the point I made is if you just stand and look out of the window without any props, you're a sad, friendless idiot. But when you look out of the window smoking a cigarette, you're a fucking philosopher. OK. <laughs> and so the same thing, you know, I mean, if you think about it, there are an awful lot of products where the value of them is highly complex. I mean, you know, whatever you think about beer or biscuits or anything like that, social meetings between human beings without some sort of food or drink prop is actually a deeply weird and uncomfortable thing. In the book, you talk a lot about the psychology of the individual consumer and apply this psychological thinking. But you also expand that out. And again, drawing on your experience in advertising and marketing and advice to businesses. And one of the most interesting things that I really enjoyed in the book was talking about trains, particularly about the psychology of standing up on a train or the psychology of making the train faster. You talk a bit about HS2. And your next object, I think I've got here, is a toy train. So I presume that's connected somehow. The reason railways are very useful little analogies to use is simply because railways tend to be run by typically male, rather, to use a completely unscientific phrase, but useful nonetheless, left brain people. What they will do is they will always try and solve a problem by improving the objective quality of the network. To be absolutely frank, OK, punctuality, I'm, I'm not disputing that uh, trains that are 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes later are a bit of a disaster. I find it a bit weird that train companies are fined if a train gets into London four minutes late because, to be absolutely honest, I mean, that's within anybody's acceptable margin of error. I'd also I think be, many of us would be extremely grateful be, be grateful just that. got in at it, four no, no, minutes late. No, the fact that it got in four minutes late. And yet they're fined for this. Now, I regard that as a bit ridiculous because any, uh, I mean, any ordinary member of the public who runs their day to that level of precision is either sort of Swiss or mad. You know, I mean, you can't really do that. Had you made the same journey by car, the variance in your journey time could have been up to 45 minutes. And do you think some of that, you talk about perception and reality a lot in the book, that yeah. the perception that you're in charge of your car and therefore it'd be your fault if the journey was yeah. was slower. Uh, whereas once you give up that control and have to surrender to the train company, and you talk as well in the book about you don't necessarily have to make the trains vastly more punctual, but if you give people better information, they'll become less that, that's irate. That's a vital one. So one of the interesting things is I met someone in the course of writing the book who was... Uh, responsible for essentially customer insight at Transport for London. The single best thing I've heard that London Transport ever did to improve passenger satisfaction per pound spent wasn't faster trains, more frequent trains, more comfortable trains, later running trains, but not matrix displays on the platform, because that's psychologic as distinct from logic. A when you say a dot, the dot matrix display, you mean the thing that tells it, you... It the, says the Farringdon, And seven then it minutes. gives you the minutes. My friends and I used to affectionately refer to them as tube minutes. I've never actually timed one on my watch, but sometimes I do get the impression that, that, that their idea of two minutes might be more like four. I think the final thing is, one, they never go up. <laughs> yes, okay. exactly. Yes. So I, I've never seen... Uh, it can as go up, it can, go it can occasionally go up. As long as they're going down, we're kind of OK. We yes, feel a exactly, sense of progress. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's interesting okay. there is that if you're a logical person, what matters is how short the time is you have to wait for the train. In psychologic, what matters is the degree of uncertainty you experience. And they're not quite the same thing. I would contend that we'd rather wait nine minutes for a train knowing it was coming in about nine minutes uh, than wait five minutes for a train in a state of not knowing. And you also um, make a parallel, which was very interesting, I think, that a lot of people will relate to, about the addition of the map function on Uber, which suddenly exactly made... Exactly the same thing. Yes, yeah. that the waiting for a taxi to arrive, a minicab to arrive, used to be infuriating because you didn't know where it was or how long it was going to be and you perhaps didn't quite trust it or you had to call the base to find out where it was. And just being able to see it doesn't reduce the waiting time, but no. you are in charge of somehow at least your response to it somehow. With Uber... The extraordinary thing is the duration of the wait was less important than the fact that you had... Well, actually, the fact that you could tell yourself a story about what was going on. You know, you'd look at the map and go, oh, look, he's stuck at those traffic lights. I'll have another pint. And the, the reason these things, which may sound extraordinarily trivial to your listeners, but the reason they're massively important is they show that you can synthesise value out of nowhere. That if you believe, as the Austrian School of Economics did, that value and our perception of value is created in our heads, not in a factory, you can... And this is important, by the way, for environmental 
um, campaigner, as well as it is for a commercial entity, which is you can change the evaluation of something and change people's behaviour towards it. Uh, their willingness to buy it, for example, without changing the thing itself. You can generate or synthesise value simply by telling a different story about something. And so the story I think I mentioned in my book, I'm sorry to repeat it if anybody's heard it before, that weird thing where I always hated it when you arrived at the airport and there was a bus to take you to the terminal because it seemed like the poor man's air bridge. And then one day I land on an EasyJet flight and the pilot says, I've got some bad news and some good news. The bad news is we won't be able to get an air bridge because there's a plane blocking the gate today. But the good news is that the bus will take you all the way to passport control so you won't have far to walk with your bags. And we looked at each other. Well, that's kind of always true, isn't it? I actually now I now see the bus as a conveyance, not an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. um, I think Robert Cialdini puts it very well. We tend to value the things to which our attention is directed and therefore directing attention to a positive in the process, mildly obscuring a negative, in fact, changes our evaluation of the thing itself. So you can change the value of a thing and the nature of a thing by changing the nature of attention. I'll give you a perfect example. For many people in London, cycling to work is really, really cool. Now... In 1988, or certainly 1970, it would have been a bizarre thing to do. And in fact, the association of cycling to work would be that it meant you couldn't afford a car, pretty much, or that you were trying to avoid even the bus fare. OK. Now, that same thing has gone from being something of a social embarrassment to, if anything, a social accomplishment. Without necessarily changing much about the actual thing itself... What's changed is the context and the stories we tell about that same thing. What underpins this is this sense, as you said at the beginning, that being rational can make you weak or at least or perhaps less likely to complain or more likely to sort of swallow the story that, that somebody wants to tell you. Perhaps you could tell us how that leads onto your next object, which is the roulette wheel. One of the things that bothers me, and I think this is why I mentioned uh, the roulette wheel, is one of the extraordinary things about human narrative construction is we tend to extraordinarily downplay the role of luck and both of us are probably in this room because of 27 at the time seemingly completely trivial events which seem to have no significance at the time but which you know in the course of a path dependent human life turn out to be decisive you know when we let's say make a business decision to attempt something we will always say we will have to perform actions A, B and C and we will evaluate the success of actions A, B and C entirely and exclusively on the extent to which they lead to our predefined definition of success. But there's another way to lead your life, which is I'm not really sure how I'm going to find success in advance, but I'm going to do lots and lots of things that might make me lucky. That's actually a perfectly valid approach to many things in life. You don't necessarily have to define success in advance. What you may want to do is just to say, and I would argue it's why people move to cities, by the way, when they're young, that whatever else happens in a city, whether it's sexually, romantically, commercially, you're much more likely to get lucky than you are in a town. If I asked my 18-year-old, I've got twin daughters, uh, they're non-identical, unfortunately, so useless for experimental purposes, <laughs> but... Um, they always go out on Saturday night, much to my annoyance, because I'm 53 and I just want to you know, stay home and watch the Discovery Channel programme about sharks. And they insist I go and pick them up from some wretched nightclub or other. And to be honest, if I ask them, why do you go out on a Saturday night? Why do you have this FOMO? It's because they don't know in specifically how they're going to benefit from Saturday night. But what they do know is that they won't get any lucky upside if they stay home. It's maximising the probability maximizing of the probability opportunity. Of upside really. opportunity, yeah. Yes. A perfectly good reason for doing advertising as a business is that the more famous you are, the more lucky you'll get. I mean, you'll know this, that the more people who've heard of you, the more opportunity that's presented your way. You Only know. if they like what they've heard. Uh, oh, if they, <laughs> actually, <laughs> some, you, no. actually, no, 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 oh, no. That's very I, comforting. I, I, no, no, I think you could be, I think you could, I mean, my colleague just went over to Ogilvy and Bogota. And the one thing I said is, don't mention the fact that you like narcos. Because if you're Colombian, it drives you insane that your rather beautiful and creative country is seen as a kind of, you know, narco-terrorist mess. And it's highly unfair, by the way, as a modern perception. But the interesting thing is, in fact, since Narcos came out on Netflix, tourist visits to Colombia have gone up quite dramatically. So there may be even, even a case where being famous 
even if it's being famous for something bad, and it, you know, it has to be said that watching Narcos is probably, you know, if you designed a tourist advertisement for Colombia, you wouldn't have made it uh, an 80 hour series about, you know, murder, extortion, corruption, and so forth. But nonetheless, People are more familiar with Colombia. It's now more distinct. It has a point of differentiation from other countries. And I suppose you think, if I can just get people here, I can at least have the opportunity to prove you wrong. To prove you wrong. And so some form of fame, you know, whether it's you, who I think is widely liked, or Piers Morgan, who seems to be slightly irrationally to me, but widely loathed by huge swathes of people for mm-hmm. reasons I can't fully understand. Oh, I'm happy to enlighten you after we finish recording. Oh, OK. <laughs> but he can't be that bad. I mean, no one's all bad, are they? I mean, I no, know. no one's all no, bad. No, no, no. Okay. I'll concede that. You'll, OK. <laughs> um, actually, mere fame massively increases the, oppor- the, the possibility of some random fortune attaching to you, and that fortune will be disproportionately positive. One of the things that's really leapt out in the book was this story of a famous hip-hop brand that made expensive clothes clothes easier to steal so that the cooler people who perhaps didn't have ready cash in their pocket but had a different kind of capital they had street sort of credibility capital. Absolutely right and the reason they didn't do much first of all you can only do this if you're a fairly high margin product and their conclusion was that the people stealing their clothes were cooler than the people buying them. Mm -hmm. This all by the way sits on a really interesting fact, which I think has to be true, which is that evolution has given us sensory apparatus, which is calibrated to maximise fitness, not to maximise accuracy. The representation of the world we have inside our heads has to be optimised towards evolutionary fitness, whether it's reproductive or survival or whatever, whatever other thing that's useful, status possibly. Because in evolutionary terms, if you can gain 1% of fitness at the cost of 10% of accuracy, it will take that trade off every time. And so if you think about it, we perceive colour relatively, we perceive brightness, we perceive volume relatively, we perceive temperature relatively. I can't put my finger in the air and go, um, ooh, that's about you know 72 Fahrenheit. But if I walked out of the room and it was colder, I'd be very, very well attuned to tell you that the outside of the room is colder than the inside uh, without knowing the precise value. And the reason for that is that in evolutionary terms, detecting contrast is probably more important than um, having an objective view of the world. In other words, it's far, far better, like a smoke detector, to be calibrated to the point of safety rather than to be calibrated to the point of accuracy. Mm. If your smoke detector goes off when you make toast, it's a nuisance. If your smoke detector doesn't go off when your bed catches fire, it's potentially fatal. And in talking of sort of calibrating things to sort of be effective or at least to perceive that they're effective, you have some great information in the book, a subject that I think lots of people find fascinating, which is placebos, which is obviously part of our perception that can even affect our physical state. And to lead us into that, there's a great clip in the audiobook where you talk about how we like to feel in control even if we're not. Uh, So let's just take a listen to that now. Take the control panels in elevators. One of the buttons found on them, the door close button, is quite interesting because on many, indeed perhaps most elevators, it's actually a placebo button. It's connected to nothing at all. It's there simply to make impatient people feel better by giving them something to do and with it the illusion of control. It is, in effect, a civilised alternative to a punch bag. I don't know if this is a bad thing, it's definitely a lie, but perhaps it's a white lie, one whose sole job is to make someone feel better. Since the only possible purpose of a door-closed button is to make impatient people relax, perhaps it makes no difference whether it achieves this end through mental or mechanical means. The use of placebo buttons is more common than we realise. Many pedestrian crossings have buttons that also have no effect at all, The traffic lights are just set to a timed sequence. However, here the presence of the button is a rather more benign lie. How many fewer people would wait for the green man if there were no button to press? And how many more people would wait for the green man if there were a digital display of the seconds to wait before its appearance? In countries including North Korea and China, accidents at intersections have been reduced by simply displaying the number of seconds remaining before the lights turn green. This is because the mammalian brain has a deep-set preference for control and certainty. And that was Alchemy, the surprising power of ideas that don't make sense, written and read by my guest, Rory Sutherland. Uh, Such a fascinating subject, isn't it, placebos, and this perception of control that we need to have that will calm us down or even change our physical state. And it may be that we take pills, or for that matter, buy fashionable clothing, 
there's a phrase I think used, self placebing that we're... <laughs> that we're administering placebos to ourselves by our actions to generate an emotional state that we can't generate at will, but which we can generate obliquely. So the example I think it's Nicholas Humphreys gives, which fascinates me, is an awful lot of what the military do appears to be nonsensical bollocks, or what I occasionally call benign bullshit in the book. Uh, you know, marching around the place in, in lockstep, uh, you know, having bands, flying banners, playing trumpets. And... Nicholas Humphrey would argue that's kind of placebo in the wild. It creates an emotional state of comradeship uh, and therefore a propensity towards bravery and self-sacrifice uh, simply by the setting it creates. If you do watch Narcos, they confuse the hell out of me by calling each other Hermano all the time. Mm. And the idea is that because we instinctively as humans have a degree of sacrifice towards blood kin, what we're doing is creating fictive kin. And what armies do in training, in making everybody live in the same place, in dressing them all the same way, is they create a kind of ant-like quality out of the human chimp. The interesting thing in terms of uh, the placebo effect, if you think about it, they're large parts of your bodily function. Um, over which you have no direct control, but which where you do have oblique control. So uh, blinking is something that can be involuntary or voluntary. Your heart rate, you can't actually increase your heart rate through an act of will. However, you can engage in behaviours that are likely to increase or decrease it, meditation being probably reductive, jogging being the opposite. If you want your pupils to dilate, again, you can't will them to do so, but you could go into a dark room or weirdly look at por pornography, apparently, <laughs> has the <laughs> same effect. OK. Mm -hmm. um, there's an awful lot about our bodies which essentially is not really um, controllable by direct exercise of free will, but where we can engage in oblique behaviours which achieve the desired emotional effect. So... It may strike you as very, very weird to know that, for example, Bond Street fashion boutiques, cosmetics and paracetamol can serve a similar function. I ask my daughters, I plug them about this because their makeup routine um, seems to me, as a bloke who grew up only with a brother, you know, the fact that it takes you 40 minutes to leave the house seems deranged. OK, a little bit of it may be about signalling to the opposite sex or the same sex. There's also, you know, uh, you know, quite a lot of fashion, women's fashion is possibly directed at other women because men don't really know what's going on in many cases, to be absolutely frank. You know, you know you never get a guy going, whoa, that's the latest mulberry handbag, mm. OK? A large part of it's probably signalling to yourself and that if you go to a party with the right amount of makeup on, wearing a particular thing, you feel a level of confidence that you can't obtain through an act of will. Now, it is an interesting question, it's an interesting philosophical question, which is how much of capitalism could you destroy if we invented really good drugs? <laughs> so if you invented the I'm really great, great looking drug, you know, and the I'm really well dressed drug, and you could invent a pill that made you feel uh, like Cary Grant, mm. uh, to men you could argue that's four pints of strong lager. But, uh, mm. um, but nonetheless, if you think about it, there is that really interesting question that an awful lot of consumer capitalism is probably a form of self-administered placebo drug. I mean, all of this is just absolutely fascinating. It's, we have to draw this to a close now, but it, it's just endlessly fascinating. I could honestly talk about this for hours. And I wish it could continue. Anyone who would like to learn more, do buy Rory Sutherland's book, Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense, to just learn a lot more about psychology and psychologic and human behaviour and all its wonderful anomalies. And just a reminder to subscribe to the Penguin Podcast so you don't miss new free episodes twice a month. You can find us at sites like iTunes or Spotify via a podcast app on your smartphone and on your Alexa-enabled device. Rory, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a delight. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>